This is Unsealing Daniel's Mysteries, and we are going through the book of Daniel chapter by chapter by chapter, okay? So we'll have 12 sessions, and the first 10 will be on Tuesday nights, and then uh, I think the last couple of weeks in December, we'll need to move it to two nights a week. It'll probably be Tuesday and Thursday, so we can just fit in all 12 uh, sessions, all 12 chapters in the book of Daniel before the holidays, okay? So we want to get that in by, I think it's December 14th or something like that. So uh, this is kind of a, we're following up on the book of Revelation. We held a seminar in the uh, Grand Park uh, Event Center recently. You're good, I better turn mine off too. Make sure mine's turned down here. So uh, we have materials for everybody, so make sure you get that. And we have clipboards for you tonight, make it a little easier for you to write on. Hope you appreciate that. That was a great idea that Tracy had. And uh, yeah, the program lasts about an hour, should be hour at the most, and then we'll be good to go by 8 o'clock. We'll have a little bit of time for questions at the end if you have any, uh, but uh, we won't have too much time left over. All right, so everybody got what they need? If you need a Bible, we have those in the back as well. Make sure your tickets are in the basket. We're going to have a drawing for several drawings tonight, actually, for some nice things we're going to give away. So uh, if you have your ticket in and you have a clipboard and a lesson and a Bible, you should be good to go. All right? So let's have a word of prayer and we'll get started. Father in heaven, we thank you that we can be here tonight together in this place again, that we can study the Bible. We're so thankful for this uh, amazing book of Daniel. And uh, we know the Holy Spirit inspired Daniel to write these words, and now we're asking the Holy Spirit to be here with us to help us understand them, understand them well, and apply them to our personal lives. So please bless this time together now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Um, our topic tonight is called The Psychics versus the Prophet. Now, you no doubt have seen these tabloid newspapers in the checkout line of your local grocery store or supermarket, right? Everybody seen those? All right. Now, some years back, there was a tabloid newspaper that had an unusual headline. It said, Bible predictions for the new year. Bible predictions for the new year. And then inside that tabloid edition, there were some amazing predictions for the coming year. And here are a few samples. They said that February 19th of that year, tens of thousands would be converted to Christianity in America. They said by April, there'd be a massive drought and thousands would die from a famine all across America. They said that in July of that year, there'd be a mile high image of Jesus appearing over the Capitol in the US, uh, United States, and then thousands would be converted as a result of that. They predicted that in August, the four horsemen of Revelation would be seen over Montreal, and then a few weeks later, over Copenhagen. By September, this was the biggest one of all, an evangelist would be caught up to heaven live on camera as the video was capturing him going up. Now, these were supposed to be Bible predictions for the new year. But how many actual Bible texts do you think were in the article inside. Not a single one. <laughs> Not a single Bible verse in the whole edition. And you know something else? Not a single one of those predictions actually came true. So then why did they use the headline, Bible predictions for the new year? Well, it's because they know that people are anxious about the future, right? People can sense that something decisive is, is, is going to happen in the future, and they want to know about it. They want to understand it. They want to be uh, prepared for it. And they, the tabloids, of course, know that people have some confidence in the Bible. And so that's why they, read that, uh, they ran that type of headline. But these crazy predictions, none of which were fulfilled that year, actually undermine faith in God's word, and meanwhile, the tabloids are cashing in big time. Now tonight, we're not gonna look at tabloid predictions, thank God. We are actually gonna look in the Bible itself 
and see what the Bible actually says about the future. So this is no scam and nobody's going to be cashing in. Tonight, we're going to get into a real live Bible study. And this is one of the most important Bible studies you could pro uh, possibly ever have. So I'm glad that each one of you are here tonight to study the Bible together. All right, now tonight we're going to go back to the book of Daniel, right? We're unsealing Daniel's mysteries. And we're going to look at an ancient king's dream that is recorded in chapter 2 of the book of Daniel. And we're going to see how the future has been foretold with amazing accuracy in the past. And seeing how the future was foretold with amazing accuracy in the past is going to give us confidence in what the Bible has to say about the future. This is the study right here tonight that at age 25, for me personally, when I read this prophecy, I, I did this Bible study, this is what made me a believer in the Word of God. And my life has not been the same since. And I, I, I believe that that can happen for anybody here tonight as well, and anybody that you might share it with in the future. Okay, so let's go to our first question here. The first question tonight says, who alone can foretell the future? And to answer this question, we're going to go to Isaiah chapter 46 and verses 9 and 10. We have it on the screen. Here's what it says. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Notice here, what sets God, the God of the Bible, apart from every other would-be God? Well, here he says, he says, I declare the end from the what? From the beginning, that is, I can predict the future before it happens, and from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel will stand, I will do all my pleasure. God claims to have the ability to predict the future with accuracy before it happens. Do you know the Bible is the only religious book in the world that contains predictive prophecies that you can actually check out against history and see if they've been fulfilled. The Quran does not have predictive prophecies. Neither does the Bhagavad Gita. The Bible alone stands as the only religious book in the world that has predictive prophecies that can actually be checked out. And the reason that God says he can predict the future is because he is in control of events. He says, my counsel will stand. I will do all my pleasure. Okay, so there's what we want to write down. Who alone can foretell the future? Well, according to Isaiah 46, that would be God himself. All right, now we're going to put that claim to the test tonight. Our second question here is, what unusual experience did Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, have one night, one night while he was sleeping? What unusual experience did he have while he was sleeping? Well, let's go back to ancient Babylon, all the way back about 25 or 2600 years ago, and we're going to go into the, the, the king's bedchamber, and maybe the window was open, there's a nice breeze wafting through that night in the kingdom of Babylon. And the Bible says here in Daniel 2 and verse 1, in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit, it says, was so troubled that his sleep break from him. All right, so what happened? While he was sleeping, he had a dream, right? He had a dream, and that dream, it says, greatly troubled him. So in the middle of the night, or maybe it was the next morning, but the king woke up and he said, I have had an important, impressive dream. And I'm not sure what I dreamed about, and I'm not sure what that impressive dream meant. Has that ever happened to you? You ever have a dream, yeah. and you wake up, and you were like, man, that was really something, but you can't quite remember what it was, and you have no idea what it means. What causes dreams? Does anybody know? Is it pizza and pasta and <laughs> spicy food digesting while you're sleeping? That's what many people believe. Maybe that's the case. But sometimes God, according to the Bible, God actually gives people dreams. When there's an important message that needs to be heard and understood, sometimes God gives people dreams. And that's what's going to happen here in this account of Daniel 2 with King Nebuchadnezzar. Question three. 
What was the king's immediate response after having this dream? Daniel 2.2 says, Then the king gave the command to call the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. And so they came, it says, and they stood before the king. All right? So he called in all his, what are called here, wise men to tell him the dream. Nebuchadnezzar called in his wise men to tell him the dream. Now, there were four groups that were mentioned there. Did you notice? One group that came in were the magicians. Now, back in Babylon, magicians used to drop some, uh, they dropped some oil on water and they watched the pattern that the oil would form on the water. And then they attempted to predict the future from that. They had palm readers, of course, who looked at the lines on people's hands to predict the future. Babylonian magicians sometimes went out and killed a cow, and then they cut out the liver, and they cut the liver open, and they read the future in the pattern in the liver of a cow. I wonder who the first person to come up with that idea was. Okay, so you had the magicians, and then you had, then you had the astrologers, it says. Now, it doesn't say astronomers. Astronomers are real scientists, right? But these are astrologers, which is a pseudoscience. Astrologers look at stellar constellations and planets to predict the future. And that, believe it or not, is something that is still very popular today. There are about 3,000 newspapers in America that run horoscopes on a daily basis. And there are millions of people that are orienting their lives and their decisions around astrology. Then there were the sorcerers. The sorcerers came in and they used psychic phenomenon and brain waves and mental telepathy to try to predict the future. And the last group, of course, were the Chaldeans. Now, the Chaldeans were the educated elite class in Babylon. They were the scholars. They were the PhDs. These were the men of great intellect and learning. And so King Nebuchadnezzar brought all four groups in and he drew around him the wise men, the world's brain trust, the smartest people that he could find. Now in Daniel 2 and verse 3, it says, the king said to all of them when they dissembled, he said, I have had a dream and my spirit, he says, is anxious. I want to know the dream. And so they said in verse 4, they replied and said, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream and we will give you what? we will give you the interpretation. Now, you know something, folks? That is something any one of us could do, couldn't we? We could just listen to a dream and make up any kind of interpretation, something plausible. And of course, it would be something positive, telling the king what he wanted to hear. And that's what these wise men were offering him. But this king was wiser than his wise men. He was wiser than his wise men. And uh, he said to them, no, he said in verse 9, not this time. He said, this time, you tell me the dream. <laughs> you tell me the dream, and I know that you will have the interpretation. And I know that interpretation will be right if you can tell me the dream. He's saying, look, if you can't tell me what happened a few hours ago in my bedroom, how in the world are you going to tell me the future? If you can't tell me what I dreamed last night, how can you predict events that haven't even happened yet? And then the king challenged them. Actually, the king threatened them. Look what he said in verse 5. He says, if you don't make known to me the dream and its interpretation, he says, you're going to be cut in pieces and your houses, they're going to be made an ash heap. That was supposed to be a motivational speech. <laughs> And then he offered them great rewards if they could come up with the dream and its interpretation. All right, now they're backed in the corner. And so in verse 10, the wise men, the Chaldeans, were the ones actually of the Chaldean group that answered the king. And they said, look, there is not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. And therefore, there is no king, lord, or ruler that's ever asked such things of any magician any astrologer or any Chaldean. It is a difficult thing the king requests, and there is no other who can tell it to the king except the gods, and they do not dwell with flesh. Now, friends, that was 
the truth. What do you say? The king needed some supernatural help. He needed some divine insight and wisdom for what he was asking. The wise men were completely out of their league and they knew it. And so they threw back the challenge on King Nebuchadnezzar himself. Well, verse 12 says, for this reason, the king was angry. Oh, he was angry. He was very furious. And he gave this command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. He said, destroy the astrologers, destroy the magicians, destroy the soothsayers, and destroy the intellectual elite, even the Chaldeans themselves. And so the decree went out and they began killing the wise men, it says, and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Now, Daniel, who wrote the book of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, his three friends, we learned last week, according to Daniel chapter one, that they were in training. They were in the group of young men that were gonna be groomed and shaped to one day become part of the wise men of Babylon. But they were still in training, and so they weren't called in to interpret the dream, and yet they were guilty by association, and so they were destined to die. Now, the fourth question says, how did Daniel respond to this crisis in his life and really in the life of the nation? How did Daniel respond? Well, we go to verse 15 and it says that he answered, then he said to Arioch, the king's captain, that's the man that was going out to execute the wise men, and Daniel went to him and he says, why is this decree from the king so urgent? And then Arioch made the decision known to Daniel. Daniel said basically, what's going on? And why is this happening so quickly? And Arioch told him the truth about the king's dream and the wise men's failure and the king's anger and the death decree. He told him the truth. Well, in verse 16, it says that Daniel went in and he asked the king to give him time and that he might tell the king the interpretation. I don't know how he got in there. I don't know how he got away from Arioch, but it just it shows him showing up in the palace of the king himself now. And he says, basically, look, Nebuchadnezzar, you made a big mistake. I did? Yes. You didn't give me time. You didn't call me in. Give me time, he said, and I can make known what you need. Now, Daniel's confidence and Nebuchadnezzar's strong desire to know that combination moved upon the king to go ahead and grant Daniel some time. Now, what would he do with that time? What would he do? Well, verse 17 says, Daniel went straight to his house and he made this decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions. All right, so he tells Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, he says, sit down, I got to tell you something. We're all under a death decree. We're all going to die unless we can tell the king what he dreamed last night and the interpretation. Now it says that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning this secret so Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Daniel was trying to save his life and he was trying to save the lives of his three friends and he was trying to save the lives even of the wise men of Babylon. And so they cried out to God in prayer and they asked God for mercy. You know, it's important to pray when you're in a crisis, isn't it? And you know, the Bible says that there is some real power in united prayer. God hears and answers the prayers of individuals, but God takes special note of times when people get together and they agree in prayer and unitedly they seek wisdom from God. Jesus said, if two agree on earth, touching anything, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. And so the four of them, they prayed a united prayer together for mercy from the God of heaven. Now, verse 19 says that God heard that prayer and God answered the prayer because the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. Now, evidently God gave Daniel the very same dream or vision that had been given to the king prior. But not only did he have the dream itself, but he also knew the interpretation. 
And then it says that Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Does anybody here tonight, could you, anybody raise their hand and say, God, I have had a time when God really answered my prayer. Anybody? I can raise my hand. I think most of us can say, yeah, I prayed and God answered. The next question is, did you take time to thank God for answering that prayer? You know, so often we go on our way quickly about our business and we forget how important it was for God to hear and answer our prayer. But Daniel didn't do that. He took time to thank God. It says he blessed the God of heaven. All right. So the answer to that question was, how did Daniel respond to the crisis? Well, he asked the Lord to reveal the secret to save their lives and the lives of the wise men of Babylon. All right? Got that one written down now? Or you might just say, he prayed. <laughs> he prayed. Yes, he did. And God heard and answered. So Daniel didn't know the solution to the problem, but Daniel knew somebody who had the solution. Amen? And Daniel went to the secret place of prayer, and the mysteries of God were revealed to Daniel personally. Now, you know, in the crisis at the close of this earth's history, there are going to be problems that will arise that we're not going to know how we can possibly get through. Your life might be threatened. Your finances might be threatened. Your job. There are going to be times crisis will come and we're not going to know how we can make it through. But we're going to know how to pray. Amen? Amen. We might not know the solution, but we know one who has a solution. And we can pray to him and he will hear and answer. Whether it's your marriage, your kids, your finances, your health, prayer is what is going to get God's people through in the last days. There are many ways to solve our problems today. Have you noticed that? Have a medical problem? Call a specialist, right? Got a car problem? Call a mechanic. Got a toilet problem? Call a plumber. Got a financial problem? There's lots of lending agencies out there eager to give you money. Got a marriage problem? Whole list of counselors you can choose from. But you know, during the crisis in Daniel's life, was there a human solution? None. There was no human solution to his problem. The only solution was to get on his knees and seek God in prayer. In the last days, friends, we are all going to be in a place like that. I believe that. And so don't forget this story. When there's no human solution to your problem, remember, you can pray. There's somebody you can turn to, and there's somebody who can help. Thank God. Number five, what two qualities does God have in superabundance? Daniel 2.20, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever for wisdom and, what's the next word? Might are his. What two qualities does God have? In abundance, wisdom, and might or power. Two things we need. Wisdom. What is wisdom? Wisdom is knowledge, but more than knowledge, wisdom is how to apply the knowledge you have and when to apply it and where to apply it and how to apply it, right? The difference between wisdom and knowledge. What is power? Power is the ability to, to apply the wisdom you've been given to a particular situation. And that's what's happening here. Daniel is getting wisdom and he's getting power from God to deal with this crisis situation he was in. Number six, who alone could reveal the king's dream. Now, standing in front of King Nebuchadnezzar, this is what Daniel said. Notice here. He says, there is a God in heaven who reveals what? Secrets. Now think about this. At this point, King Nebuchadnezzar didn't even know the true God. He was a worshiper of idols. The Babylonians were idolaters. He was all, worshiping all kinds of false gods and idols. He didn't even know about the true God. And Daniel could have come in, you know, and he could have just promoted himself. He could have said, here I am. I've got the answer. It's a good thing I'm here and really promoted himself. But instead he said, no, he said, I don't have any wisdom more than anybody else. He says, but there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. And think about this for the first time, this heathen king, this idolater is now looking and thinking about the God of heaven for a solution to his problem, all because 
One man was in a position to witness for God. Amen? God puts people in positions because he wants to use those people to reach people that don't know him. Amen? And God may put you in a position. I'm sure you're in a position right now in some way that God wants to use you to lead people to him. Daniel's doing an excellent job of that right here in this account. All right? Now, um, it doesn't say there that there might be a God in heaven, or maybe there's a God in heaven, or I think there's a God in heaven. What did he say? There is a God in heaven. I like the certainty of that. The assurance of knowing there's a God in heaven who reveals secrets. And so if there is some secret in your life, or some mystery coming in your future, and you don't know what it is, and when it comes, you don't know how to deal with it, just remember God reveals secrets. He did it 2,500 years ago, and he continues to do it still today. Now, write that one down then. There's the answer. Who alone can reveal the king's dream? Only the God in heaven could reveal the secret. All right, now, here's the second part of that question. What period of time does the dream we're talking about, what period of time does it apply to? Listen carefully. He said, there's a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, what will be when? What well, says in the latter days? What does latter mean? Later or last or end. And so this dream that King Nebuchadnezzar had has to do with the latter days. Wherever the dream begins, we know it ends at the end. We're going to find out tonight. This dream stretches over a long period of time and takes us all the way to the end of the world. This is a dream that's going to take us through the corridors of time, beginning in 600 BC, all the way down to the final days of Earth's history. All right, number seven. What did Nebuchadnezzar see in his dream? What did he see? Daniel 2 and verse 31 says, You, O king, were watching, and behold, you saw a great what? A great image. Now Daniel is telling the dream, and he says, You saw a great image, and the great image whose splendor was excellent, it stood before you, and the form of it was awesome. All right, so we know that the dream was a dream of an image with great form or great splendor. It was awesome in appearance. And remember, Nebuchadnezzar was an idolater. They worshipped images, and so this imposing, awesome image was sure to get his attention in the dream. Now, we find that this mysterious image is made out of four different metals, and these metals, they are uh, decreasing in value, even as they are increasing in strength. These four metals decreasing in value as they increase in strength, okay? So let's look at them. Let's label the corresponding metals here in this dream. We're going to read verses 32 to 35. Are you ready? Daniel 2, 32, the image's head, Daniel says, it was of fine gold. The chest, the arms, they were silver. The belly and thighs, they were bronze. The legs were iron. And then it says the feet were partly iron and partly clay. Golden head, silver chest and arms, belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron, and the feet were part iron and part clay. And then it says in verse uh, the next verse, it says, you watched while a stone was cut out without hands. It struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. And then it says the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold, they were crushed together. They became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. And then the wind carried them away and no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image, it became a great mountain and it filled up the entire earth. All right. So what did he see? He saw a big image, golden head, silver chest and arms, belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron, feet of iron and clay. And then as he's watching this image, suddenly this stone comes from out of nowhere and it takes aim at the image's feet at its weak point where the clay was and strikes the feet and they burst like a clay pot. And then no foundation to stand on. The entire image came crashing down. The fall of it was so great, it became like dust on the floor. And then a great gust of wind came and just blew it all away. And the only thing left now was the stone, the rock. But he noticed it started growing and increasing and enlarging until it became a great mountain and it filled the entire earth. And that was the end of the dream. And the king 
awakened. Okay, so there's what it looks like. Gold, silver, bronze, iron, iron and clay, and then comes the stone. Now, <clears throat> Nebuchadnezzar at this point, what's he thinking? What's he thinking? He's thinking, this is incredible. That is what I dreamed about. I remember now. I remember the image and the gold, the silver, the bronze. I, I remember the rock and I remember the great mountain. And then I woke up. And so now he knows the dream, but he still doesn't know what it means. Does he? Does he know what it means? No, he doesn't know what it means. Now, how are we going to figure out what it means? How about we just pass out paper? Maybe Tracy can give us all some paper tonight. We can all just write down what we think it means. Anybody vote for that? No. But you know, that is the way that a lot of people interpret prophecy. They read these symbols and things, and they just start conjecturing and speculating, well, maybe it means that, or maybe it means that. But you know, the Bible says there is no prophecy of the Scripture that is of any private interpretation. That means none of us can just sit down and try to figure out what these things mean. We have to let the Bible interpret itself. Amen? Amen. That's a very important principle. You let the Bible interpret itself. In the Bible, you find answers to the symbols that the Bible employs. All right? Now, we're going to find that happening right now. In Daniel 2.36, Daniel says, now that was the dream. And now we are going to tell the interpretation of it before the king. And now Nebuchadnezzar is thinking, good, I want to know what this dream means. And surely if this young man can tell me what I dreamed in the privacy of my bedroom, then he's in touch with some higher power than the wise men ever were. And he's eager to know the interpretation. And God is revealing the dream through his prophet, the prophet Daniel. Okay, question nine. How did God describe Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom of Babylon? Here it is, verse 37. He says, now, you, O king, well, you are a king of kings. For the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. So far, Nebuchadnezzar must have been very pleased with the interpretation. He says, wherever the children of men dwell, wherever the beasts of the field live, and the birds of the heavens, it says, and wherever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field, the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand, he has made you ruler over them all. And he says, Nebuchadnezzar, you are the head of gold. All right? So the first clue in the interpretation is the golden head represented Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, which was what again? Babylon, right? Babylon is represented by the golden head. And you know, that was probably a good symbol to use because Babylon has gone down in history as the golden empire. This was the wealthiest, richest, most affluent society ever to exist on planet Earth. Ancient city of Babylon was just full of gold. It was luxurious. They had these broad streets and boulevards. They had temples and universities. They had the hanging gardens of Babylon. They had uh, tons of gold were, were put into the temple of Marduk, their chief god probably in the center of the city. They had the Euphrates River with a nice water supply. It was a beautiful place in the desert. Babylon, the great. Golden head, a fitting symbol. You know, they found this letter. Archaeologists are confirming the greatness of the kingdom of Babylon. They found this letter from Nebuchadnezzar. And in the letter, it says the whole earth was prostrate at Babylon's feet. And then Nebuchadnezzar himself wrote the words, may it last how long? Ah, forever. He wanted it to last forever, and the people thought it would last forever. That's how great Babylon was. But we're reading Bible prophecy, and the Bible predicts here that Babylon is not going to last forever. And in fact, friends, the Golden Empire of Babylon only lasted about 66 years, from 605 B.C. to 539 B.C., all right? And we're going to find now that God is predicting the fall of Babylon and the rise of other empires and kingdoms down through history after Babylon fell. So question 10 says, how does the Bible describe the next three world powers? How does the Bible describe the next three world powers? We're going to verse 39 now, and it says, after you, that is after Babylon, there's going to arise another kingdom, and it's going to be inferior to yours. 
Silver is inferior to gold, right? And so this would be an inferior kingdom, but yet it would rule the world. And then there will be another one, a third kingdom of bronze, even less valuable, and that's going to rule over all the earth. And then verse 40 says there will be a fourth kingdom, and that one will be as strong as iron. See what I'm saying? It's decreasing in value, even as it's increasing in what? Strength. Strength, right? Okay, so we've got the gold, the silver, the bronze, and the iron, and these represent kingdoms and empires that have existed on planet Earth down through time, beginning about 600 years before Christ and continuing on down into the future, all right? Three more world powers have come after Babylon, one of silver, one of brass, and one of iron. Question 10, A, we should put down there that after Babylon, there would arise another inferior kingdom. And of course, we look back in history and we find that the silver empire, the one that conquered Babylon was called Medo-Persia. Medo-Persia. I know it says Persia up there, but it was the Medo-Persian empire because it was a two-sided coalition. The Medes and Persians came together to jointly defeat the ancient kingdom of Babylon, all right? And it's interesting that history takes note of the fact that it was in the Medo-Persian Empire they began to mint silver coins. And so the silver chest and arms, two-sided, Medes and Persians coming together to defeat the golden head of Babylon. Now, Cyrus was the Persian general who actually defeated Babylon in 539 BC. And this man, Cyrus, was actually named by name, and his work in defeating Babylon was predicted in prophecy in the Bible 150 years before this guy was ever born. Listen, Isaiah 45, verse 1 says, Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to who? Cyrus. To Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him, and loose the armor of kings, and open before him the double doors, and the gates, it says, will not be shut. God said there's going to be a guy named Cyrus and he's going to conquer Babylon and he's going to do it because the gates are not going to be shut. Well, you know, the story of the fall of Babylon is a very interesting story and we're going to get into it in detail in, in our chapter five study. All right, so three weeks from now, on Tuesday night, we're going to dig into this incredible story of the fall of Babylon and the role that Cyrus played in that. But here's the short version. The Bible describes in Daniel chapter five, the Babylonians were having this Babylonian banquet one night in the king's palace. A thousand of his lords had gathered for this festive banquet. And in the middle of the proceedings and all the fun and revelry, all of a sudden a hand appeared in the palace, a, a bloodless hand, just a hand, no body, just a hand. And they watched as they saw what is called the proverbial handwriting on the handwriting on the wall. It was writing on the plaster of the king's palace wall. And they called Daniel in eventually after trying the wise men again. Daniel came in and he read the writing on the wall. And the, and the writing said, many, many tekel upharsin. And in interpreting that writing, many meant God has numbered your kingdom of Babylon and finished it. Tekel means you, that was addressed to the king, have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. And Perez, a form of the word Eupharsin, means your kingdom of Babylon has been what? Divided and given to who? Ah, the Medes and the Persians. Look at that. So the Bible predicted that Babylon would fall and be replaced by the Medo-Persian Empire. And it happened exactly like the Bible predicted. There's something called, archaeologists have found something called the Cyrus Cylinder, which actually confirms the story I just told you and shows the reliable, reliability of the Bible when it comes to predicting the future with accuracy. All right, we're not done yet. Let's go back to verse 39. And it says, the Bible describes these other powers. We have Babylon, the Medo-Persia, and then it says another third kingdom, what's it made out of? Bronze is gonna bear rule over all the earth. So. Medo-Persia wouldn't continue on forever either. It was going to be defeated and it was going to be replaced. And sure enough, we look back in history, what do we find? In the Battle of Arbela in 331 BC, the Medo-Persians were conquered by this guy right here, Alexander the what? The Great. 
Alexander the Great, who was he? He was the king of Macedonia, and he was the leader of what became the empire of Greece. Greece took over. You know, it's recorded that Alexander marched his army 11,000 miles, conquering almost all the then known world before he died of malaria at the age of only 33. Anybody know, anybody know who else died at the age of 33? <laughs> Jesus. Jesus did, right? Now, Alexander died in a drunken stupor. After he'd conquered the world, he thought he had the whole world, but he came to his death, and after that, he had nothing. Jesus looked like he had nothing in this world, but after his death, he has dominion over everything. Amen? Amen. Who would you rather be like? Alexander or Christ? Christ. Both had the same number of years on earth. One will have an eternal dominion, and yet the one that looked like he had everything ended up with nothing. Somebody said, when you're breathing your last, when you're dying, the radiation therapy hasn't worked, the chemotherapy hasn't worked, and you're lying in the bed, and you're breathing your last, and that massive heart attack has taken you away, and you're going into the grave, there's only one thing that matters then, and that is knowing Jesus as your personal Savior. Unfortunately, we don't see any record that Alexander knew Jesus as his Savior, but he was um, a very powerful man in his day. Now, what did Alexander's um, armies, what, 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 what metal did they, did they use when they went out to, to make war? Well, we find in history that they used bronze breastplates, bronze helmets, bronze shields, and bronze swords. These bronze instruments War implements parallel the symbol of the golden weight, uh, I'm sorry, the, the bronze waist and thighs in Daniel chapter 2. It's like God was looking down through the tunnel of time into the future and he saw those, he saw those Greek soldiers out on the battlefield and he said, Daniel, the, the third kingdom, put that one down. That's going to be the kingdom of bronze. In the historical library of book 16, chapter 12, it says, I'm persuaded there was no nation, no city, nor people where Alexander's name did not reach. It says there seems to have been some divine hand providing, uh, presiding both over his birth and his actions. Look at this. Flavius Josephus, a uh, Jewish historian, uh, in his book said, when the book of Daniel was showed to him, they actually showed um, Alexander the book of Daniel and the prophecy, and, and wherein Daniel declared one of the Greeks would destroy the empire of the Persians, Alexander supposed himself to be the person intended. And he was then glad. And the next day he called them to him. He called the Jews to him who had showed him the prophecy and he bid them to ask whatever favors they might want and he granted everything that they desired. People understood prophecy. They were predicting events. And sure enough, Alexander fulfilled it just as prophesied. Now Greece would rule the world from 331 BC all the way to 168 BC. Uh, but history doesn't end with this third kingdom of Greece, as you can see in the image. Greece did not rule the world forever. There would be a fourth kingdom, and what's that one represented by? Iron. The iron, right? The iron. That's the strongest metal. This is going to be the strongest one. The legs are the longest part of the body. This is the kingdom that's going to last longer than the other three. Which one is that? Well, that would be what has been called the Iron Monarchy of Rome. Right, Rome was the one that came and fulfilled the image, part of the image, uh, using the metal of uh, iron representing Rome. And, and it was in the Battle of Pydna, if you want to write that down, it's P-Y-D-N-A. In the Battle of Pydna, in 168, that's when Rome conquered Greece. And then Rome ruled the world for about 500 years, all the way to 476 A.D., and what a fitting metal it was to choose to represent Rome because, as I said, Rome was known for its use of iron. Here's what Edward uh, Gibbon wrote in The fall and De Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. He said, the images of gold and silver of brass that might serve to represent the nations and their kings, they were successively broken by the iron monarchy of Rome. Now, that is not a religious person writing that. That's just a secular historian. And he says, you know, he's, he's, he's using Bible prophecy here to show us this, this uh, rise and fall of powers, Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, and then the Iron Monarchy of Rome. All right, there is a slide that shows the area of the Roman Empire. You can see it there marked in red. It was quite extensive. 
And uh, you might remember that Rome was the, was the kingdom in power when Jesus was born, right? It was Augustus Caesar that led Joseph and Mary to go to Bethlehem to be taxed. It was uh, the Roman uh, governor Pilate before whom Jesus was tried. It was the Roman crucifixion that put him to death. He was sealed in the tomb with a Roman seal. A lot of things happened in the Roman Empire concerning Jesus of Nazareth. And the legs of iron spread all the way into the, um, into the uh, AD era, almost 500 years. All right, number 11. What did the Bible predict would be the fate of Rome, the fourth kingdom? What's going to happen to Rome here according to the prophecy? Well, verse 41 says, Whereas you saw the feet and the toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom, that would be Rome, will be what? It's going to be divided. It's not going to be conquered by one other power. It's going to be divided up. And yet the strength of the iron will be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were part iron and part clay, so the kingdom will be partly strong and partly broken. So the answer there is that the Roman power, the Roman Empire would be divided. All right? It doesn't show a fifth metal like magnesium or zinc or copper. It says that one, the iron one, will be divided. Now, it mentioned the feet and the toes, right? How many feet would be on the image? Two feet, and how many toes on each foot? Five on each foot. You got two feet with five toes. How many toes do you have? Ten total, right? And the ten toes indicate that Rome would be carved up into ten primary parts. Now, here's another point where we can actually check prophecy against history and find out, was Rome divided? And was it divided into 10 primary parts? Well, sure enough, we go back into history, we find that Rome was divided. It was conquered by the barbarian tribes that descended upon it, was weakening because of immorality and wealth and extravagance, much like America today, by the way. And so that it became, it became ripe for destruction and the barbarian tribes came in. And by the time it was all finished, the Roman Empire had disintegrated into 10 different parts. You can see they had the Anglo-Saxons, the Franks, the Alamanni, the Lombards, the Ostrogoths, the Burgundians, the Herli, the Suevi, the Visigoths, and the Vandals. All right, everybody, take out your paper. We're going to take a quiz real quick here. You're going to write all these down. <laughs> no. Um, but does anybody notice that map up there? What does that look like? What part of the world is that? Europe. Yeah, that's Western Europe, right? And did you know that these barbarian tribes grew into these nations with names that we, rec rep uh, we recognize today? The Anglo-Saxons became the English, the French became the, the, Franks became the French, the Suevi, the Portuguese, the, the Visigoths, the Spanish, we the, the Burgundians became the Swiss, the Alamanni, the Germans, the Lombards, the Italians. Now the Ostrogoths, the Heruli, and the Vandals, they're extinct. They don't have any descendants today from those three. And when we get into Daniel chapter 7 later on, We'll find out the Bible actually predicted the extinction of those three powers, and we're going to find out how that happened when we get to the seventh chapter. All right? But the point is that these are kingdoms and nations that still exist today. They're on the map, right? You could go visit these countries. They're over there in Western Europe. Now, the dividing of Rome was complete by 476 AD, and divided Europe has continued to exist our day here in 2021. And so that begs an important question. Would the nations of Europe that were once divided ever be united into one cohesive, lasting political empire? Again. In other words, would the nations of Europe ever come together as one? You know, what do we call our country? The United States of America, right? We don't call it the United States of Europe, do we? They're all separate. They're not united. Okay, now they've tried one currency, but that didn't work too well. And so they remain separate. And the question is, will they ever unite together as one political nation again? Well, let's read the prophecy. Let's see what the Bible says. Daniel 2.43 says, As you saw the iron mixed with clay, they will mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they will what? They will not adhere or stick to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay clay. Friends, on the authority of the Bible, on the authority of God's word, we can predict accurately that the nations of Europe will not adhere to one another. Now, 
I don't know if you noticed this, but in verse 43, he says, they will mingle with the seed of men. What does that mean? Mingle with the seed of men. Well, that's a phrase that means they will intermarry. They will intermarry. Why would they intermarry? Well, they intermarried because they wanted to unite. Listen, uh, in Europe, marriages for years were uh, arranged between families in Europe for the sake of forming political alliances. It was very, very common. In fact, if you go to Fredericksburg Castle in Denmark, it confirms the accuracy of God's word. Listen to this. In this beautiful castle in Denmark, there's these wall hangings there. And it reveals how people tried to unite Europe through intermarriage. They mingled with the seed of men. Here's one of those wall hangings. And it shows uh, the different marriages of royal heads of Europe. And it shows that they all go back to King Frederick and Queen Diana. It was just like one family trying to intermarry with another until they had cemented a, a, a cohesive uh, pact. And yet, despite these intentions and efforts, uh, it didn't happen. Uh, there have been architects, there have been many architects of a united Europe. Charlemagne tried to unite Europe together. He failed. Louis XIV, Charles V, Kaiser Wilhelm, Napoleon Bonaparte, and most recently, Adolf Hitler. What do, what do they all have in common? They all tried to unite Europe, and they all what? They all failed. And some of them failed miserably. Here's one, Napoleon. Look what he wrote in his journal. He said, there'll be one Europe, one currency, one language, one government over all of Europe. You see what he was trying to accomplish? And yet, um, the battle of what? He met his Waterloo. Weapons got bogged down in the rain, the elements. And uh, it's interesting, in the Lectures of Modern History, number three, it says, what was the principal adversary of this tremendous power? Talking about France and Napoleon's movement. What was the adversary of it? By whom was it checked and resisted and put down? What's the answer? By none and by nothing, but the direct manifest interposition of who? God. And, you know, even Napoleon, even Napoleon recognized that. He said in his... Uh, one of his statements, he said, God Almighty was too much for me. Mm, what a confession. And you know, there have been many people. Uh, take Hitler. Hitler was trying to unite Europe together, rule it as, a, as like the Roman Empire. That was his goal. And he was marching through Europe with the tanks and everything. And then there was this uh, in the group over there uh, on the west. And the rain started falling, and, and Hitler's tank started to slow down, and, and then, uh, then the fog moved away. And, and then the boats could start coming in, and they called that the evacuation of Dunkirk. Remember that? And all those Allied forces were able to escape. The English went back over to England. They got out of there. The big, big, uh, big uh, what do they call that? Anyway, you know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> and over there in England, then the Allied forces came in and joined and, 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 you know, they were revived and they came back and Europe was spared by the interposition of God. Great military minds and powerful war machines have been stopped by seven words. Here they are. They shall not cleave one to another. Just like that. They tried. They failed. They tried. They failed. God said, you're wasting your time. They will not cleave together. All right, now so far, the prophecy has predicted accurately the rise and fall of world powers. Here they are. Babylon, the golden head, Medo-Persia, the chest and arms of silver, Greece, the thighs and waist of brass, Rome, the legs of iron, and then Rome fell and disintegrated. It was divided up the nations of Western Europe. All right, everybody see that? Is it clear? Are you amazed? Tell you, I was amazed. I used to not like history in school, you know, <laughs> memorizing dates and names and things. But when I saw this, 
suddenly I became excited about history because I saw, oh, it, it really is not history. It's his story, God's story of where he's leading the world. All this happening. God has a plan. God has a purpose. And things are headed to a conclusion. And what is that conclusion? Well, question 13 says, what's the next event on the horizon of history? Now we're in verse 44, and it says, In the days of these kings, stop right there, in the days of what kings? Where are we on the image by this time? We're down at the bottom, right? I say it's talking about the divided nations of Europe. In the days of these kings, plural, what's going to happen? It says the God of heaven is going to set up a kingdom, singular, a kingdom which will never, what? Never be Destroyed. It's like God said, okay, you guys, I'll give you some time, set up your kingdoms, see how you do, and then when they all fall and fail, then I'm going to set up a kingdom. And it says when God sets up a kingdom, that kingdom will not be left to other people. It, will not, it is going to break in pieces. It's going to consume all these kingdoms. And it is going to stand forever. Look at that, forever. And inasmuch as you saw it says the stone cut out of the mountain without hands, that broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. The great God, Daniel says, has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will come to pass after this. And look at that. It says the dream is what? Certain. Certain. And the interpretation is? Sure. sure. Oh, you can count on it. Daniel said, this is the future as God has revealed it. Now, who is the rock? Who is the rock? In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4, you know, Paul is referring there to the Israelites coming out of Egypt. They went out in the, in the desert. They're on the way to the promised land, and there was nothing to drink, right? Nothing to drink in the desert. That's a big problem. But then all Moses had to do was strike the what? The rock, and water gushed out to, feed, uh, to, to quench the thirst of the people and all their livestock. And Paul, recalling that event, says that rock was who? Christ. That rock was Christ. Throughout the Bible, the stone, the rock, that is talking about the Messiah and his kingdom, immovable, unshakable, the rock of ages. We even sing the song, rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. And so God has set up a kingdom and that's never going to be destroyed. So for 2,500 years, this prophecy has been accurate and God says the next event in prophecy is the rock cut out without hands. Friends, we've got good news, don't we? Amen. We are living at the end of time. Can you say amen? amen? We're living at the end of time, and Jesus is coming soon. That was not the message for Nebuchadnezzar back in 605 BC. The message for Nebuchadnezzar was, your kingdom is not going to last forever. He was not going to be around at the coming of the rock. But I want to think, I believe, that is the message for us today. We are living on the cusp of the eternal kingdom. Because Babylon has come and gone, Medo Persia has come and gone, Greece, Rome. Rome's been divided now for many years. And we are living at the, well, we're down at the bottom. We're, somebody said, are, are we in the toes? What do you think? Yes, we are. Somebody said, not only that, we're in the toenails. <laughs> <laughs> the dream is certain the interpretation is sure friends how's the world going to end and how soon will it end you know back in the year 2000 an internet search yielded the top 10 possible causes at the end of the world some predict the world, uh, a worldwide war nuclear war, pollution, greenhouse effect diseases, asteroids super volcanic eruptions the zombie apocalypse <laughs> global warming solar flares, and last on the list, people. People themselves will bring about the end of the world. Well, none of those things listed there in the year 2000 are the ultimate cause of the end of the world. But according to the Bible, this is the ultimate cause of the end of the world. I declare tonight the world is not going to be consumed by a nuclear holocaust. I'm not saying there won't be some nuclear bombs go off between now. I don't know. But that's not going to bring about the end of the world. The end of the world comes when Jesus returns. What do you say? Amen. That's what the Bible clearly tells us there. The stone that struck the image, that brings about the end. All right? 
So there we have it. <clears throat> Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and divided nations of Europe. What are we waiting for? We're waiting for the return of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Now, before you go home tonight, I want you to write down in your notes there these three words. Repetition, repetition, and enlargement. Okay, you got those three words? Repetition and, what's the third word? Enlargement. enlargement. Repetition and enlargement. Um, how much time do I have left here? Oops, not much. <laughs> so I'll just leave it at that, okay? So repetition, what that means is that in the Bible, these prophecies are repeated. They're what? Repeated. repeated. And every time they're repeated, they are? Enlarged. Enlarged. They're expanded. Every time it's repeated, more information is put in there, and you start to get a clearer and clearer picture of what God is telling us about our world and what's going to happen between now and the end of time. So um, this is the first sequence of world empires that appears in prophecy, right there in Daniel 2. And I said this was one of the most important Bible studies you'll ever have because knowing the sequence, knowing the sequence, you now have the key to unlock the rest of the book of Daniel because this time prophecy is repeated three more times in Daniel 7, in Daniel 8, and in Daniel 11. Okay, But if you didn't know this, you'd be scratching your head and you'd never figure out the meaning of these later chapters. But now we've got the key, we see the sequence, we know the players, we know where we are, we know what to expect, but there's a lot of detail we need to fill in now between now and what actually happens before Jesus returns again, okay? So we're gonna leave it there tonight and let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the sure words of prophecy. They have some certainty, and certitude about them. We can, we can look back and see the fulfillment of this amazing prophecy in Daniel chapter 2. Thank you, Lord, for showing us where we are tonight. Thank you for showing us that we don't live in a world that's just spinning out of control, that uh, through the play and counterplay of human events and the rise and fall of empires, you were silently and secretly working out the counsels of your own will. We know that Jesus is coming back. There's no doubt about it. We're living in the end time, the last days, and we can say, uh, with surety, Jesus is coming and coming soon. Lord, help us prepare for that kingdom that we all might be a part of it. We just want to say with the thief on the cross who looked over in his dying moments and recognized Jesus as the King of Kings and said, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. We say the same tonight, Lord, remember each one of us and our families. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, let's do our drawing real quick.